Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome to this week's edition of The Reverts. Uh, you've been following us in a, an intricate series of discussions, both individual and, and group debates, around what the plight of reverts in the British Muslim community is. Often ignored, often misunderstood, often just simply uh, blanked. How are Muslims, born Muslims, uh, treating those who emerge in Britain uh, as reverts, uh, as, as it were. I have with me Hannah Smith, who's been leading you through those, uh, those dialogues and discussions over the course of these weeks. And uh, along with Hannah, I have uh, Bilal Ali. Welcome, Bilal. And I have Alexis uh, Carsten. Alexis, uh, I'm going to start with yourself. This issue of reverts, first of all, the whole concept and the word reverts um, for a person who comes from Iraq, Pakistan, Indonesia, Africa, any kind of Muslim you'll find any, anywhere in the world, when they come to Britain, they come across this word reverts. What does that word mean to you? Is it something you're comfortable with? Because it's a word which often, even amongst the revert community, has connotations, has a, a, a dispute. But what does it mean to you? Uh, revert in itself is, uh, doesn't have any bad meanings for me. I mean, uh, I'm very comfortable with that word. So, I mean, converts, reverts, it doesn't really make a big much of a difference to me. I mean, the only thing about converts is where you, where you, where you could say, well, the person has been converted. That means he's been changed into something and in, into something else, not maybe the original state, but the word revert actually indicates that he has been brought back to his original state and we all believe that we were Muslims before we were born, you know, at least uh, following God. So revert for me means personally coming back to the state where, where, you, where you follow God. So I'm comfortable with that actually, yeah. Okay, and so Bilal, this idea that everybody's born a uh, Muslim, is that where this, this concept comes from? Um, that is one uh, definition, that is one accepted definition of the term revert, but also from what I'm aware of, um, going back, say, 20 years, when the term revert was used, it was used amongst many, essentially, African-Caribbean brothers and sisters, and the socio, sort of historical aspect of the word revert, the term meant we're not being converted, as, as Baba Ali said, changed into something different. But we're actually reverting to our roots, as in the sense of being of Caribbean um, descent, really of sort of West African stock, West African descent, and Islam having roots in West Africa, so we're, we're kind of re returning to the religion of our forefathers. So it had that dimension at the time, but you know, as words change, they evolve, they take on um, different meanings, connotations, and so on. So it's, there's an extended meaning, but that's that's the meaning that I understood 20 years ago. The idea of reversion, uh, Hannah, for me, in nature, you think about metamorphosis, and you think about transition, mm -hmm. and you think about the process of change. Probably the most fascinating part of human existence, arguably. Um, is, is the period when people are changing or, or developing or evolving, perhaps. Is that what it was for you, evolution? Evolution? Um, all the reverts I've spoken to, and I agree with this myself, um, when you're learning about Islam, you're actually finding something um, that is already within you. you um, you're attracted to Islam because it's something that you agree with. Um, you compare it to your previous life and you're finding a concurrence between um, what, how, how you perceive the world and how Islam dictates the world um, runs, basically. Um, then you, you're finding this path, you know, you are embracing feelings you've always had. For example, maybe you've always rejected materialism in society. Maybe you've always rejected promiscuity in society. Um, you are affirming something that you already believe. And then when you make the affirmation, you say shahada, then you are going to change your life because there are many aspects of your life, probably, if you're um, someone that's coming from outside the faith, into the faith to start practicing Islam, you are going to have to make many lifestyle changes. For example, if you were drinking alcohol, you're going to have to stop. If you're a woman, it's likely in the West, you're going to have to start wearing more clothing, covering your hair and so on. So it is something, it is both something innate and so it is a change and it is an evolution um, because these things happen gradually. Um, you, 
you are drawn, you're led on a path, you know, you, you're attracted to one thing, you question that, and then you are led to another thing, perhaps another book, you read about something else, you have another question, and you are led on this slow journey where you find answers to your questions which relate to, you know, why am I here, what is the nature of reality, and so on, how should I live my life. Um, and then you slowly become Muslim, and this, can, this is the journey of life, um, that it's not just a revert will make, it's a born Muslim, you know, constantly reflecting upon the exterior world mm -hmm. and your feelings and your relation to it, and then finding better and better ways of reacting to it and improving okay. yourself. I'm going to bring uh, Carl, Carl in on that. Uh. No, the thing is uh, about b becoming a revert, before I, before I was a revert, I, I always believed in, in a God, and I was always a monotheist. And for me, being a revert is just uh, taking on a few extra things that, that kind of made, made sense to me, because even before I reverted, I was living like the European uh, lifestyle, and certain things that I was, I was doing, I realized there was something wrong with that, and, and uh, I, I wasn't... Uh, I, I realized that that something had else had to take place and to, to to changes had to be there, and so when I when I came to came across Islam and I found that certain things made made so sense this, this uh, dealing with these issues. Then, then this this interests sense. me because definition is really important in this mm. day and age. We get so many words fired at us. We uh, things get lost in translation. We assume certain words mean certain things. Some words are around us all of our lives. And those words become almost just uh, treated in a blasé word, bl blasé way. The word Muslim is one of those words for a Muslim. You grow up, if you're born into Islam, with the word Muslim thrown around you all the time. And it amazes me how many people don't actually bother to actually ask the question even, but what does the word mean? Okay, let's take the word as being one who submits. Let's take the definition. I'm going to start with the definition of the word Muslim as one who submits. Submission to what? Submission how? And submission when? In what circumstances? There's a whole analysis to be done just on that word, Muslim. It seems to me that if you're going to be uh, somebody who is in a Muslim community and born within that community, there are certain presumptions that you might make, certain assumptions you make that you're in some way born into a faith and therefore uh, you have it. Regardless of what it is, there's no need to question it, there's no need to make inquiry. Um, it's quite the opposite if you're not born into a family that, that has the Islamic faith. And therefore, that whole inquiry process is either an inspirational element, which is direct with God perhaps, or is, it's an inspirational thing that is done through a book or through an experience. Is that what you think uh, allows people who come into the faith with that questioning approach to be deeper, perhaps? Bilal? Um, I'm not sure if, if people who come into the faith are deeper. That, that in itself might be an assumption, but I definitely know that there's generally, I would generally say from my contact with, with um, people that have reverted that, there's a, a period of search, of deep search, because to come from Jahiliya, whether that be from a Christian background or from other faith background, but or non-religious background, but to actually move from non-Islam to Islam is a big step. So that in itself takes a whole set of, of research and, and a certain type, you, you kind of gain a, a certain type of mentality in terms of checking and rechecking and questioning. So in that sense, yeah, um, it takes a very, very... Um, yeah, arduous research, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm trying to initially delineate also for the, for the audience that's listening to us, many of them may be uh, people who've never come across reverts. And I'm trying to sort of uh, demarcate some of the, the points of uh, coming together and some of the points of diversion mm -hmm. and analyse the base of that. What's the fundamental mentality that is there within somebody who comes to Islam from an inquiry uh, as compared with someone who doesn't, Hannah? Um, well, their main, the, the fundamental thing would be that they have actually um, found it for themselves. Um, if you're born into the faith, you've inherited it. 
Um, I've met many born Muslims that have gone through uh, a kind of reversion process themselves at some point in time, normally when they start to mature and become an adult, they've actually questioned their faith. Um, and then that questioning has um, led them to a deeper understanding and they've become convinced um, that it's the truth, whereas before they might have just been practicing without understanding or true conviction. Um, this would, this is the fundamental difference and that fundamental difference means that you're going to face many issues. You're going to have to make many lifestyle changes that a born Muslim may not have to make because they're already practicing but not, they may have to practice more but they have a sense of identity. You're changing your identity. You're um, saying I'm now this and this thing is going to dictate my entire life. Whereas if, if you're born Muslim, your, your religion is linked to your culture. Um, and this can be very challenging for reverts because you're going to, as you change your lifestyle, you're going to come across barriers, um, people from your old social circle, um, maybe resistance that change, they may be unkind, they may reject you, you may um, and then this, this can obviously lead to things like loneliness. Um, well, let me throw the figure issues. out. Let me throw the figure out. 70% or so of uh, revert Muslims who come into Islam actually find it really difficult and do leave. This is some of the latest study and research. This is a shocking figure. It's yes. really quite frightening. And it's something which, by defining what revert is, and we've had that little discussion, I, I'm trying to sort of get partly the mindset of people who are Muslims born into a certain culture of Islam to understand what's going on. Because the responsibility of people within the faith, surely, from my perspective, is, is pretty uh, major in terms of the help required, the, 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 the nurturing, the protection, the support. And I'll bring in the example of Medina uh, and, and Mecca, the Hijra. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, orders, orders the Hijra, immediately there's the first thing he does is brothers, emigrant with indigenous. Because he, there's a fundamental understanding that here are new people who are going to come to Islam, and he, here is a group of people who have traveled out of their, uh, their safety zone or their comfort zone. It's a natural thing for a give and take to take place. So he was creating and nurturing the environment of that exchange to take place. Do you think that kind of environment has been created between the revert communities in Britain, the revert Muslim communities in Britain, and the Muslim immigrant communities that arrived in Britain? Has that been done? Is it being done? And can it be done better? That's three questions, but we'll dissect them one by one. First of all, do you see signs of that happening, Carl? Um, well, the thing is, you can't really expect born Muslims to understand revert issues. And uh, I think some sometimes when these things go wrong, partially the reverts are themselves, uh, I have to be careful with my words, but almost uh, in a way they are themselves to blame. Because from what I hear sometimes is they, they go into the, into these centers, you know, and uh, they, they go into Iraqi centers, they go into uh, Pakistani or Khoja centers, and they expect culture not to take place there, and they expect to um, get in, get in there and, and feel absolutely comfortable. I, I, I you know, we I, I saw one of your previous programs where we were saying should some of these centers actually be non-cultural, you know, and be more be more open and more open to communities. And I personally think that would be a disaster if that were the case, because like I want to go. Into a, into a center and I want to experience, for example, Iraqi culture, I want to experience Hoja culture, I want to experience Pakistani culture because I want to see, see something different, you know. And it is then up to me, sorry, I'm touching the mic, it is then up to me to say, right, okay, I can accept so much, this makes sense for me, and what, what I can't, uh, that I'll just stick to what, what, I, what I really am through my identity. and. I think I think that's that's the way forward, you know. And and you know, like some places may be a bit more open-minded than others, like the places where I go to, 
they know that I'm different <coughs> yeah, and that I can't accept and follow them and everything. But they say to me, uh, these are mostly like Kuwaiti and, Ir and, uh, and uh, Iraqi places, they say to me, listen, as long as you stay in the club, that's okay. And the things that you don't understand, just leave them for a side, maybe you'll get them later on. They may think that what all but they say is correct and that 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 is the islam you know but they don't sometimes always notice that sometimes culture has affected their understanding of islam now i can't go in there and say you're wrong because that's the way they are and that's the way they feel comfortable you know nobody can they can't for example tell me i shouldn't be th uh, this way and uh, my being austrian is a problem they don't do that, so how can I go in there and say your being a, uh, uh, an Iraqi, for example, is a problem? So we have to accept the people the way they are, and then share what we have in common. And then for the other things, just simply do that on the side by ourselves. You know? And I mean, there's one, uh, one, there's one Husaniya in, in Clickwood. Can you say names here? Actually, yes, absolutely. Yeah? Okay, Rasul Adam, for example. You know, they have a men's section, then they have a women's section, and then they have a section for the youths. Yeah. And they do their own thing there because they've been raised also in the West. You know, they will probably do things completely different than what happens in, in, in the men's section. Yeah? And from time to time, a scholar may go in there and give them a lecture. But once he leaves the, the, the youth section, only God knows what goes on there, you know. And, and I mean, not saying that something bad goes on there, but mm -hmm. of course, they have their own ideas, you know. And I think if you're going to uh, have uh, introduce these new ideas into centers, you know, don't force the whole center to change as a whole, you know, mm -hmm. just say, okay, there's a section for this, there's a section for this, and there's a section section for this, you know. I mean, I'm sure that uh, in, the, in the youth section, everything is all right, and that, that, that they're not up to any uh, dodgy stuff or, mm -hmm. or con contradicting what well, goes on. Well, Carl, but, what, you, what, but, you've, but what you've raised like is this issue that those centers themselves yeah. and those communities have their own problems. Yeah. They have their own complexities. Mm. They have their own issues of perhaps immigration, acceptance, yeah. racism perhaps even, mm -hmm. uh, inferiority complexes, children maybe uh, out of control, not following their culture or their Islam the way that the parents want. Huge communication, generational uh, communication issues. In a way, that's the context in which Ariva arrives at these centers with this kind of quite uh, spiritually high-minded uh, <laughs> uh, introduction from the book, the holy book of mm -hmm. the Quran. You come from that ideal world of that the, the Quran inspires you with, mm -hmm. and you suddenly arrive with the reality of a cultural Muslim community of whatever description, here in London or Preston or wherever it is that you happen to be, and they clearly are going to disappoint you and clearly it seems that they're not going to be necessarily equipped with the toolkit to handle what their own problems are let alone the baggage that say Ariva perhaps brings with with him or her with that complication there is it realistic for us to expect um, a real overnight adoption do you think that's a realistic aim I don't, I don't think it's realistic, and I'm, I don't necessarily see it anytime soon, but um, two questions arise within the context. Are the, what are the centres? Are they cultural centres or Islamic centres? Because if they're Islamic centres, then there's a universality to them that should be, you know, pe Muslims should be, I guess, in the, not even ideal world, but just our courtesy, should be inclusive of Muslims. At least, even if not mm. non-Muslims, but you know, a strange—he doesn't look like he's from Rani Walsh. I haven't seen him. But, you know, mm. a spirit of um, hospitality should exist. I think amongst all Muslims, regardless of culture, if it, if it's a cultural center and it's there to preserve a particular culture, and it's not necessary, and Islam isn't the agenda, but an agenda in there somewhere, then I guess that's what it is. If it says what it is on the tin, then you accept it for what it is. But if you believe that it's a, it's a universal element, you go with the expectation. So when you're speaking in a language and we're in Britain and you're not speaking English language and there's no problems in English, I mean, things have changed now, but I'm, talk, I'm going back 20 years. You're not really welcome or it's not for you. Mm. And you think about the book says Islam is for everybody. You kind of assume that if Muslims are somewhere, they would want it to spread. So they would be out in the street or they'd be interacting. They'd see someone that's coming that's, that wasn't a born Muslim. Wow, that means it's successful. 
that we're dowering, but maybe people ain't dowering. So when they see Muslims turning up, um, reverts turning up, where the hell did he come from? Or where did she come from? Like, it's a surprise. We ain't, we ain't able to cater for you because we, we didn't even go and call you in the first place. So that yeah. raises a that raises an issue in itself. What is the place? Is it a cultural center? Is it Islamic center? Are they mutually exclusive? So I guess we're getting more questions than answers, really. Sure, but well, maybe that's what we're doing here: is to raise all the questions because these are often brushed under the carpet. The other thing that communities are really good is that facing up to problems is to actually sweep them aside and hide them and pretend they're not there. Carl, do you wanted to come back on something that? Alex, uh, Alex. Sorry, Alex. Yeah. Uh, something which uh, uh, Bilal said. No, it's just you can't separate people from their culture. That's the problem. You know, even at the Ark, for example, the Ahlul Bayt Rivet community group, most of the people there are from from the Caribbean and Jamaican. So when I when I go there, you know, some things may seem like a bit unusual, but I can't walk in there and say, right, we're going to do everything the Austrian way. No, it's, I mean, uh, it doesn't I think work as, that way. As a woman, mm -hmm. I, I have a slightly different perspective. I mean, mm. as I always say to people that as a reaver, you become a kind of cultural chameleon. You learn to adapt to mm. any situation. You learn to adapt to foreign mannerisms, foreign food, foreign clothes, um, mm -hmm. absolutely everything is different. Like the, I can't describe the amount of culture shock I felt when I first went into an Islamic gathering. Everything is different from sitting on the floor, the way people eat. Um, but when you're, when you're making that kind of change, a complete life change, um, you're willing to do anything for it. You don't mind and you, you do, you accept this other people's culture. Um, and you are an extreme minority um, within that, so you, you can't expect to impose your culture upon um, a different culture, so you just accept it. But I think the problem comes when there is no give. Uh, and I think of myself as a woman, um, there are many revert sisters that, because you know the lack of revert men, and because they often want to marry into a Muslim family, to have that social support network, that family structure that they've perhaps lost from their old Christian family, whatever religion they were. Um, they marry um, born Muslims, but they end up losing their identity and becoming very frustrated after many years of marriage, for example, because the expectations of a, a wife are different to those of a husband. Um, the woman is normally expected to take on more cultural changes than a man. Um, she will be expected to cook her husband's favorite food. You know, if a white revert woman marries, for example, an Iraqi man, she's probably, in most cases, going to end up cooking Arab food. Um, and then you learn on the cultural norms. And because you're a minority, you, you it's a sense you assimilate or you die. Um, and then you you lose sense of your identity because you were British and you had your European culture and now you've a, you're living an Arab culture perhaps or an Asian culture and although as Muslims we know that culture is irrelevant um, we're just here as travellers in this world and the most important thing is worshipping God you can you you don't feel at home anymore in the world you, you lose that comfort zone um, and you are like a you are like a fish out of water. You know you are not quite right in the Arab family, and you're definitely not right in your old European family. Um, and I think that's because Muslims, perhaps as reverts, haven't tried hard enough to express themselves culturally, to create their own cultural norms, um, because there's um, a lack of confidence on the Muslims' part. We always. Many Muslims feel, and this is the impression I get, that they're not allowed to, once you've embraced Islam, think for yourself. You just trust the scholars. Um, and the scholars aren't innovating, because the scholars are coming from the Middle East, from Asia. They are coming over for um, an ethnic immigrant community, and they are providing for those needs, and those communities want to preserve their culture. Um, they're not catering for the Riva or the indigenous Muslim that might want fatwas promoting different cultural expressions, um, more, not liberalism, but um, just 
trying trying a new path, perhaps. Well, I, the, there's so many fascinating things. We could probably run a whole series of programs just on the things that you guys have raised here, to be honest. And I don't think we're going to be able to do justice to all the points that you've been raising. But uh, a couple of the things that come to mind. Uh, firstly, what is it that these communities are doing wrong, which adds to the problems of reverts? The cultural immigrant Muslim communities, what are they doing wrong, which adds to the burden of a revert Muslim who's just come into the faith? Uh, and what are, the, what are those telltale signs to educate those communities who might inadvertently be doing it, uh, but actually driving away and creating or adding to, to this 70% of reverts who come to the faith and leave. And actually, hang on, 5,000 reverts, apparently the figure is yes. 5,000 per year. Yeah. So per annum, 5,000 people uh, from, from a non-Muslim background, non-sort of born Muslim background in that sense, come to the faith. Mm -hmm. And then, that, by my calculation, that's possibly 3,500 people or more leave within a year, two years, whatever. That's a shocking figure. I think that should frighten us as, as Muslims in terms of our, our, what our responsibility is to help those guys. Now, what I want to try and get to around the table is what are the, what are the experiences, what are the kind of personal experiences you, have you guys had which might contribute to that 70% leaving? Because you've been strong. You guys have got through it. You're still here. You're Muslim. You know, you've gone through that. Alhamdulillah, you're, you're still there. But what are the sort of things that you went through which... Uh, might become indicators for the culturally uh, immigrant Muslim communities uh, that could be, you know, benchmarks for them to sort of avoid to add in, in terms of adding the problem that, that, that the reverts already have in terms of adapting to this change. Uh, and let's start with you. Um, well, I think um, the first thing is that born Muslims don't realise how difficult it is to become Muslim, how m the lifestyle changes affect you emotionally um, and how much support a revert needs um, because you've potentially, at best, become disconnected and ideologically detached from your family. Um, your family have a different meaning in life um, and that can cause a lot of friction, even if it's not explicitly at the surface. Um, at worst, people are completely rejected by the family, they're thrown out of their homes, then they become, you'll naturally become distanced from your old friends if they're living an un-Islamic lifestyle and they're not willing to embrace your change um, because they are feeling uncomfortable with it, um, because they just don't want to change their own life. Perhaps you always went down the pub together for your um, recreation and leisure and now you don't go down the pub, they're not willing to go to a restaurant or go to a cafe, so you're... You just drift apart through their own selfishness. So, so emotional, the emotional state of yes. a, a revert, a, a female revert, I mean, you're going to talk from a personal experience. Yeah. Uh, emotionally, how, how fragile were you and for how long, if you were fragile, uh, during this kind of this change period? I would say it lasted. I mean, I was lucky because I re reverted at university and I went... It was a very academic process. You know, I came in and I was absolutely convinced through logic. Um, so I had a good foundation. Many Muslims come into, many reverts come into the faith because they're just known a Muslim. Um, they didn't have a really solid understanding of the theory before they became Muslim. So it's a bit shaky. And then when they make shahada and everything changes and they they have to, um, confront their family, all, all these challenges, they, their faith is not strong enough to cope with it, and I was lucky I didn't have that, so... But did, did you get emotional I had a support? Close, I had a close friend at university, okay. and I, I, I was, I so, think so I survived so well. So he became your so emotional well. support, yes. your, your, your um, opposite I, rock, I like. didn't enter the mainstream Muslim community until about two years ago. Mm. I was, just because of, you know, I converted when I was 20, and I left university when I was um, 24. You know, I had a long chunk of my reversion life at university, and I mixed in Islamic societies. Okay, and when, for when, me, that when, was a when, no, comfort let, let, zone. Let it was when, an easy, When you came, when you came into the society, in. yeah. it sounds like you had somebody who was solid. Yes, solid. But when, when you came to the community, I want to get to this. Yeah. What did the community do in your, in your eyes that, that was either not adequate 
or could be improved? Well, I can tell you that I had a very close friend that was my friend mm. before I became Muslim. Mm. And I was drawn to them because I thought, well, they're really normal. They don't, you know, have a big beard and act in a strange way. And that friendship lasted and they supported me in a non-judgmental, mm. they did not do dawah on me. They were just, I became into Islam after I'd started to question life and I went through, I looked at science, I looked at philosophy, I looked at other religions and I came to just by chance, not by chance, subhanAllah, came to Islam and they supported me. But when I went into Islamic societies, I never really felt truly part of them. One, because I had a, my, I had a Shia inclination, I was introduced to Shiism just before I made Shahada. I had no idea about the sectarian um, um, schools of thought in Islam. Um, so I was doing my, I was continuing my research at university about, for example, Sunni and Shia differences, but I, when I went into Islamic societies, I made friends, but, but did, did they connect I, they emotionally didn't, to you? Did, I, did they connect you emotionally? It, I, some, some sisters I met I felt more close to because they were the kind of women that I would be close to anyway. We had similar personalities, similar interests, and that's um, what allowed our friendship to grow. But I don't think they ever realised how hard it is for a revert. Okay, I'm going to stop, I'm gonna stop you there. I, I think I, I'm going to hold you How lonely you can be. I'm going to yeah. hold you there because I want to bring in Bilal and, and uh, 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 Alexis. Uh, Alexis on this. I want this basically to focus on the emotion because you've raised one issue. We could end up going around the houses on this. But I want to focus on this emotional uh, issue uh, round, round the room because I think it's very, very important in terms of the communities not knowing that this emotional need is. That's a woman talking about her particular experience on one aspect of the problems she faced in coming into the community and connecting with them. As a man, were those emotional issues there for you, Bilal? There were, there was challenge. There was definitely challenge. I mean, when I first um, became Muslim, um, I braced straight into Shia. Fortunately, there was um, revert who were, as I said at the time, um, were African Caribbean brothers. They had experienced before me like some disappointment, some rejection, or, or, or for whatever reasons, they were trying to establish their own community. So I kind of slotted into a support network of, uh -huh. well, these guys are all Muslims, I can learn this slack with them, I can learn these different things with them. And when I go to different environments, Muslim environments, regardless of, of the, the ethnic group, it would, I would be tending to go with, a, with our little jama. So that was, that was a kind of comfort zone. But what I found is that there wasn't any warmth. There wasn't anybody say, oh, you're now your Muslim brother. Um, so how are you, Bilal? Or, you know, so what do you do? It was more like people speaking at me if they bothered to speak to me, just to give me a cookbar, just to offload, kind of just to go about something to do with the margin that they're following or a particular issue that they just, you know, like, so I wasn't... They were polemical rather yeah, than... Yeah, I didn't feel like a person, personal. like you, you're, not, you're knowing me as a person. I, I see you sometimes and you speak at me and then we, we say salam and, and that's kind okay, of... Okay, that was off-putting. Yeah. That was a problem. Yeah. Let, I'm yeah. trying to go around because I want to be fair and give everybody a, a fast wrap. And it is, we've got a, a time limit, so I'm going to try to get through as many of these reasons as I can. And later in the series, I hope to go back to these and do justice to each one of these issues because I think they almost require a program on their own, to be honest. The idea of emotional um, uh, intellect and how it plays a role with reverts and, and with host communities and even just emotional intellect as a whole is a hugely ignored subject in terms of spirituality, faith and the way we live our deen. But uh, Alexis, w with this issue of emotional um, warmth, can you relate to that? I mean, with the communities you came across, did, yeah. you, did you get that warm, generous connection from, from the communities? Uh, actually, always. I mean, especially from the Arab communities, because I grew up in, in the uh, Arabian Gulf, so I, I know what they are like, and I, and I was uh, accustomed to their ways very early. Okay, so yours so is I, a bit of a I, different. I, I can I can find, I can f I don't have these problems, you know. I mean, if I was reliant on on, for example, Pakistanis or 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 Khojas, I hope this doesn't sound bad, you know. I, I might have some same problems like some of the other Arabs have, but because in the way I'm so used to Arabs already, I know how f how much we ha we can share. In okay, common. so the fundamental the thing, the thing is also difference that, for you yeah. is that mm -hmm. you grew up in the Emirates. That's yeah. very important because yeah. now each each one of you comes from. A different background. Norfolk, you, you grew, grew up South in London. South London, you've grown up in the Emirates. So yours is a fundamentally different one. I just want to yeah, kind of emphasize yeah, yeah. that. Okay. But I think this this emotional state you know, of emotional detachment might only be temporary because if I can come back to Rasul Adam, for example, in London, yeah, the youth over there, they are growing up in this country, yeah. So they understand 
white be uh, white people much better than than the grown ups. Yeah? Now the youth over there they're actively actively involved in the running of the Hosania. They're in charge of the media section, you know, doing all the camera work and various other activities for the adults even. So um, and these people will one day grow up. And they will be in charge of running the Husaniya, and they will un be able to understand why people are, are I'm so afraid of saying anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Caribbeans, yeah. yeah. He's, he's black. Right. <laughs> Is it okay to say it's all right. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, so, I mean, they will be able to understand these people, uh, us, much, us much better, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's only a temporary state, so I think the way Rasul Adam is going about it is a good example. Yeah, uh, that the youth are involved yeah. in the running of the Hosania, you know. So I don't want to come on to solutions, but we will um, towards the end of the program. I want to talk about you know positive solutions, but we've begun to analyze and unearth one of the kind of major uh, blocking points. It sounds like the empathy you receive from communities as a whole seems a little bit. Uh, standoffish, cold. There could be many reasons for that. There could be linguistic communication issues. There could be, like as we've said, cultural issues, definitely. We've discussed those. There could also be just um, issues in terms of they don't know. They just don't have the skills, Hannah. I think um, uh, I was going to say, when you asked that question initially, um, that they they don't understand what we're going through because they've never been through itself and they are a large collective of body have been through similar experiences and they're then you are so different to them um in the sense that for example when i became muslim my family were very hostile about my decision um and i grew up in the countryside as well where there are absolutely no muslims i grew up in a small town of sixteen thousand people i will go back there and i'll be the only hijabi and obviously that turns heads. Um, and if I walk into an Islamic center in London now, and I know I can sit through an entire majalis probably, and no one will talk to me unless I make an effort because it's, um, people assume you're okay. Um, they assume you have friends. Um, it's nature of British culture to be aloof, um, not to impose yourself on others, um, but, I think the community needs to be aware that if that person looks a bit different, doesn't matter whether they are Reva or born Muslim, in this society they could be incredibly lonely and be going through some really difficult challenges because if you've been rejected by your family, you've, if you've made this step on your own in particular, if you didn't have a Muslim friend or a Muslim circle, which many people do, they've literally been watching an Islamic channel or they've come across a religion at university, they've got no support network, no friends, they've then got their family going crazy at them. Um, they want to meet people um, to support them and to share their newfound beliefs and to teach them about how to live. And you, you, could, you could just exist in a state of isolation for a long time because of the way the community is so unwelcoming. Um, well, so this is uh, the... the an interesting point because Islam's values are primarily about generosity, hosp hospitality, kindness, giving, um, mercy, compassion. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it not the case that with a lot of institutional religion and with a lot of uh, people who adopt faith, they concentrate so much on the rituals and the do's and don'ts of how they practice or get so absorbed in the cultural distractions of their own, you know, their own backgrounds or their lives, that often it's these values that are forgotten. And what you're highlighting to me is that if you, if you go into a mosque and in Imam Bagra and you're not getting generosity and you're not getting hospitality, you're not getting compassion, you're not getting empathy, you're not getting people who are connected, uh, there's something quite intrinsically uh, wrong with the atmosphere that's been created in those institutions. And that's something that, first of all, those, th those communities need to take a serious look at. And they need to sort of stop brushing that under the carpet. And I think perhaps that's something for management and the institutional managements to seriously consider. Because if this is, uh, if this is something which is across the board and it's driving away 70% of Muslims, or is a factor in driving away this, this 3,500 reverted Muslims, then I think that's something that we've got to take very, very seriously and take responsibility of. I mean, as a, as a, a Muslim who's come to this country, I'm talking, in a way, in beha on behalf of 
those communities to say as a Pakistani a Kashmiri who's, you know, uh, an immigrant within this country, uh, it's a responsibility for me as a Muslim to, to I feel, uh, perhaps engage. And partly that's why these, this series is being initiated, because it's a platform we want to create to bring these issues out and to, to put them on the table, not to, not to tell people off, not to insult people, not to abuse people the way they're doing, because there's a lot of good work being done by these centres. But certainly with regard to this very, very important sector of our, our, our community, I'm kind of very, very uh, concerned about the idea of a campaign that, that highlights or creates awareness. Because is it just that they're not aware, Bilal, Bilal perhaps? Quite, uh, quite possibly. And um, it's, it's, I think there's an Arab saying that sometimes if a person doesn't have something, they can't give it. So you do meet in these centres and places that you go, you do meet people. In my personal experience, I have met people that have been nice and warm and friendly to me or, you know, interact with other Rebut brothers or whatever. There's always, but there seems so few. Yeah. The brothers seem yes. so few. Yes. Mm. So few. So to say that, you know, it doesn't happen would be a bit of a, not a bit of a lie. But, you know, it's just like, why is it always this brother? I've known him for 20 years. No, he just don't, you know, say enough. You know, like it's, it, 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 the inference is, you're not particularly welcome. I could be reading it wrong, but that's how it, that's how it's received. But um, you know, hopefully programs like this will bring the issue out because man, it's a pink elephant in the room. You know, we're naming it like in council they say naming it, bring you know, it's been congruent saying what's going on instead of like it's a kind of a assumption. We just shake hands and all make eye contact and we all shake the the, um, the imam with the salat's hand and then we go and you know this is not this is not this is not good. Islam, Islam stands for like he said. The truth and justice, but this this hospitality is a big thing. The, the prophet's personality, peace one of is is a very generous person to even smile in sadaqah, like to you know just to have that warmth as a human being mm. before you even go and just start giving data or ignoring them. You know, it's a person. It's well, a Ale Alexis, I mean, even before we've begun to look at toolkits that we could develop or education or any formal solutions to to this problem of so many reverts leaving the faith and, and it's a huge subject so we're not going to be able to deal with it in, in one session but we focus on emotions we focused on compassion on the values of islam as being a tool for uh, beginning to help some of those reverts to find more warmth more love more more understanding within our institutions and within our circles that's a big thing to highlight it's a it's, it's a first step can you think of any other possible um good practice that we could adopt as as Muslims who are, you know, born into particular cultures and, and are born into the, the faith, if you like? Just maybe one thing that, I mean, I see this happening in some places, in, in the places that I go to, and maybe if the, the reverts went to places where this kind of approach happens as well, where they just simply accept that you're white and that you're different, that, you, that, that things are going to be different for you and that you can't follow them all the way or something like that. To be honest with you, when I hear some of the revert stories, you know, about not being accepted, I, I just I just wonder where you guys have gone to, you know, because I was always warmly accepted everywhere I went mm. to, you know. Mm. But then I I don't know, maybe maybe it's maybe You maybe had a good experience. I've always had a good experience yeah. everywhere so I went, yeah. yeah. Uh, except except the only times when things really went wrong is when things got political, you know. when I when I was persuaded to get involved in political <laughs> issues which which in hindsight for me as an Aus for me as an Austrian are none of my business really you know and uh, I, I shouldn't be getting involved in that I mean that that all these various communities they have their their issues and I mean just look at the Middle East uh, sometimes it's a mess and of course these they bring some of these uh, ideas with them here to mm -hmm. Europe and, and somehow they get in, in, mixed up with the, okay, with that's the religion. That's interesting. The first time you yeah. had any trouble was more of a political thing. But yeah. let's, let's focus on more solutions. As the program draws to a, a close, I'd like everybody to just think a little bit more about possible answers to some of those solutions. Possible answers for bridging the gap between Muslims, uh, cultural Muslims, immigrant Muslims, Muslims who've, who've been born into the faith and the reverts. Uh, what, what other solutions can you think of in bringing um, these, the, the, the communication gap or misunderstanding uh, uh, to, 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 to be turned back, if you like? Okay. I think um, to answer most of our problems, it would be education. Um, I think there needs to be more dynamic intellectualism or even some intellectualism in the West. We are 
heavily reliant upon um, the Middle East and Asia for our ideas, um, for fatwa, for innovation. Um, and we are living in a different society with different issues. Um, and if we want to bring Islam to life, um, Islam, you know, was revealed so that human beings could reach their absolute human potential. I think we are, we are not reaching our potential at all in any sense of the term. Um, if you look at the world at large, it, we've got yeah, so many wars going on, so much corruption, so much vice, so, so much pollution. Um, Islam was revealed to address these problems so human beings can live in harmony together and in the purest way. Um, and worship mm. Allah together mm. and so we, education you think education, education we need to um, the whole community needs to look into their religion more I mean reverts by nature normally have done quite a lot of research about Islam because they've they've encountered it they've been attracted to it and they've researched it and they've embraced it and then that intellectual journey continues but many born Muslims are practicing their faith based on hearsay they've never many of them have never read a book on Islam um, they've just learned to pray from learned to pray from their parents they've attended majlis but this is not enough in the West we don't have an Islamic state here um, and for us to have um, a sustainable community where our children will want to be Muslims they need to really understand Islam at its core and understand why it's better than the alternative, which is at the moment, it's like secularism, atheism, materialism. And um, that would make them presumably a better advertisement, yeah. a better access point for yeah. non-Muslims or even reverts who and come to the faith. That will to fix many with. of these problems. That means that people will understand the Islamic manners and the etiquette more. Um, they will understand the the love and the compassion in Islam mm -hmm. and how they should act towards others. Mm -hmm. Bilal, um, what, what about you? More solutions. I'm looking for solutions. Solutions. I, I think that, um, that the Muslim, the Shia Muslims need to engage in active dawah. Might sound a bizarre solution, but I think actually interacting with people who are, are non-Muslims, when people are converting, you, you'll have a kind of um, like a continuation of care almost, like I've dawah this brother, I'm responsible for him, now he's taking the shot, it's not like give him a Quran and, and see you later, you, you, then you'd know him as a person. I think that, I think also like a, a, a thought forum for, for issues like this to be raised, I think on a kind of regular basis, interactions between what can um, brothers and sisters who revert to Islam bring to the community, and also, likewise, what can a community do? So it's a two-way street. It's not just us cup in hand, like we're the poor reverts that need all the help. Because a lot of us have been to university or been in business or, you know, bring skills. Not being utilised for the community, really, being marginalised. So make it a two-way street, you know? Okay, and uh, the word family comes to mind. Is other communities you came to families? They sound like you did come across a, a family of Muslims. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that might be a, a, a good practice which other communities and institutions have to adopt is create that sort of family kind of vibe, if you like, that you, you were lucky enough to, to, to come across. Yeah, I always, I always felt very included from, from, from the moment I, I entered, you know, I never once, I mean, sometimes maybe it was almost a bit too, too quick, too, too much too soon, no? but uh, like, like, like I say, I don't think a solution to the problem would be to somehow change the born Muslims, you know, it's just uh, the only thing that Muslims should uh, maybe accept is that reverts will be different and look at things different differently, you know. And uh, the one alarming thing that I find is like when, for example, reverts, they go to the Middle East and they, they go into houses, they come back almost as, 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 uh, as, as, I mean, we send them there as reverts and they come back as almost born Muslims. Uh, and they come out with things where, you, where we think, have you, have you completely forgotten what it's like to be a revert? I mean, like, for example, on the issue of inherent, inheritance, you know, I recently, uh, some time ago, I heard a, a revert scholar, you know, speaking about how you're not allowed to pass on inheritance as a Muslim to a non-Muslim. And I'm thinking, have you realized what you've just said? You've just said that anybody who, come, who reverts, yeah, for example, at the age of 50, for example, yeah, and his kids don't, and, and, and he has to make his will or something, he can't look after his kids. No. Have you realized that? That's a disaster. And of course, there are some scholars who, many scholars will, 
will, will, will say, no, you can't give inheritance to, to, to a non-Muslim. But some scholars will go and say, the reason why that rule existed at the time of Muhammad was because the, the, uh, there, was a, there was a war going on between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. Yeah, so if, if a Muslim, or for example in Mecca at the time, would have given his inheritance to his non-Muslim relatives at the time, that money might have been used against the, the, the Prophet and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. I mean, this is the reasons why this exists. I mean, can I mention a name, for example? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Ayatollah San Sanai discusses this quite nicely, you know, and he says it's okay to, for, for, um, for, for Muslim to give inheritance to his uh, non-Muslim children because they are not really enemies of Islam. Probably they don't even care about Islam anyway, so they're not really a threat, you know, so pass it on. So at least this this person can then look after his, his kids, but if you come along and say you can't look after your kids, then it's another reason for a guy to just simply leave and become one of the 7,500, well, 7, no? Yeah. An absolutely fascinating and absorbing discussion. We haven't yeah. even scratched the surface. Um, really, the, the, the topic is uh, an intriguing one because some of the issues that are being raised here in terms of reverts and the, the, the plight of the revert community that's leaving the Islamic fold, having come in, um, also applies to young Muslims, Muslims growing up in this country who are asking questions. If we don't find the solutions as communities, as community leaders, as people with finances, with control and power uh, over the way Islam evolves and develops in Britain, I fear that we're going to have a situation where we're going to be out of touch and we're going to lose and be actually doing a disservice to Islam because we're not educated, not aware enough about what the problems are. Perhaps research is a good point to start. Mm -hmm. A lot more research around this by uh, intelligent uh, scholars, thinkers, young people doing PhDs needs to, needs to be increased. Uh, there are solutions that have been suggested around the table. I'm sure in future programs we will discuss even more solutions. We will analyze the issue even more. But I think the problem goes beyond just looking at the issue of reverts leaving the community. And that's shocking enough in itself. The problems that I'm hearing and that are being raised by uh, a lot of the panel today and, and during this series uh, really strike at the heart of some of the things which the Muslim community is brushing under the carpet and pretending it doesn't exist because they are difficult problems to deal with and we don't want to be unpopular by coming up with solutions which sound like they aren't anything to do with our original experiences in uh, countries which aren't necessarily Britain. Britain has unique problems, unique issues. British Muslims have unique issues, unique problems. We need unique solutions. It's a challenge which the ulama need to rise to. It's a challenge which the academics and the intelligentsia within our community needs to rise to. But some of the most simplest solutions that have been discussed today here are very, very simple. The Prophet said, peace be upon him, he said, I've come to give you two things, good ethics and good morality. And if we can reflect on that as a, maybe a summary of what my colleagues have said today, the manners, the akhlaqiyat, the, the love, the emotion, the compassion that we give to people who are almost coming in, leaving a whole world and coming into a, a, an area of complete uh, novelty. It's a real responsibility on us who are, are, are born into the faith to extend our hands as warmly as possible as the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have liked. And I think it could be a two-way process as well. And I'm sure there are reasons why reverts themselves struggle uh, beyond uh, those which link them to the, the, the born Muslims. There must be a lot of other reasons which, which, help, which make them fall back out of the faith. Either way, I think it's the responsibility of especially the thinkers within the community and those with, with the wealth and with the economic control to support and enhance maybe centers which focus particularly on the revert community could be one possible solution so that there is a model which all communities could come and visit and actually be able to understand and, 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 and look at the way uh, revert communities live and what their issues are and where they could showcase and highlight those problems. But I mean that's not to turn it into a zoo. Quite often you can turn these sort of uh, model schemes as being sort of zones, no-go zones for other Muslims, but I'm sure that's not the kind of solution we're looking for. I think we've discussed solutions. I'll give one last 30-second burst to each one of my colleagues just to sort of say a, 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 a parting word from all of you. Hannah. Um, 
I absolutely agree with everything you say, Mohsin. Um, yeah, I think we all need to just reflect upon ourselves and how we're behaving and our Islam, and then really all the problems will be solved. Bilal? Um, let us be confident about the message because the answers are in the message. Okay. Alexis? Um, basically, poor Muslims are not to blame. Reverts should go in there, take what fits them, stay true to themselves, and then live happily. Inshallah, you've been watching the program, uh, The Reverts. Until the next, uh, next edition, uh, assalamu alaikum and take care.